at Red Cloud Vancouver. Red Cloud Financial Services is your preeminent source for mining industry opportunities. The team provides a unique tailored marketing program dedicated to reaching the right people from its mining-focused global network, giving clients access to industry-leading events and conferences, retail and institutional marketing, plus an in-house growth-driven digital agency. Red Cloud Financial Services has access to some of the mining industry's most notable companies and CEOs. Tune in every Thursday at 4.15 p.m. Eastern, 1.15 p.m. Pacific for weekly corporate presentations. For more information, visit redcloudfs.com. Good morning and happy Wednesday. Welcome to Digging Deeper. Uh, a big thank you and shout out to Red Cloud for presenting uh, another great guest. We've got Greg Smith, who's the president and CEO of Grounded Lithium. No surprise, we're talking lithium. We're talking Western Canada, which is great. I'm, I spent a lot of time in Calgary. This is going to be a great uh, chat because uh, we've got a team, we've got a board that's ready to go. And this is an RTO. So this is an opportunity for someone to, to see some milestones being hit very rapidly. Um, let's talk about uh, Grounded Lithium here. Uh, Greg, how's it been going getting it to the stage you're at right now? Um, it's been going very well. Uh, we've uh, been progressing very rapidly through our uh, milestones. Uh, we only formed less than two years ago as a, as a company and already have achieved quite a great deal in that short period of time. Um, yesterday was our shareholder vote, uh, special shareholder vote to approve our RTO. And uh, we expect the other party to be voting, VAR Resources, to be voting on theirs um, tomorrow. So that should see us trading in uh, early next week or sometime next week, or maybe the following week, depending on how things go with the exchange. But we're very hopeful that it's all going to progress quite rapidly, along with everything else that we've been doing. And that's a testament to the uh, team that we've put together to pursue this. This is mining. But yes. <laughs> really take advantage of the oil and gas experience that our team has. And it's a team of experienced resource professionals that are focused and know how to get things done. So in less than two years, we've expanded our land position. We're now over 250 square miles, sections is what we call them in Western Canada, of land uh, position. Uh, we've built a resource report that's 2.9 million tons of lithium carbon equivalent in place. And we've drilled our first well. Uh, so uh, we're, we're enjoying moving this forward. It's, uh, we've got a great team assembled and they are good at getting things done. Yes. I mean, we always like to talk about the management team. I mean, yourself, you've got over 35 years. And I see uh, when you were at Petrobach and you, you grew up grew production from 2000 BOE to 50,000. I mean, that alone, uh, we won't get into that detail because that, that would have been a remarkable story to, to get into as to how one does that. But that kind of gives people a snippet of the, the level of expertise and that the range from the finance to the, the geo, uh, the oil and gas sector, you've got it all in, in your, uh, your board as well as your management team. And uh, this is, as, as people will kind of follow, this isn't the, the hard rock story. This is a brine going into, uh, it's, I mean, I'm assuming some of these are old wells that maybe not be even using, but that we can refurbish them and really highlight Western Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan specifically as being leaders in this new energy shift. Yeah, that's true, Andrew. Um, we, we can use old wells in this yep. area, but we have a, something that's both a blessing and a hindrance okay uh when we chased the geology uh and it took us to this area uh the one thing we recognized as being an, an attribute is the lack of oil despite being in the leduc dupereau sequence which is one of the most prolific oil zones in western canada there's no oil here and um when you start to move into dle oil is a bit of a hindrance so we came here because we we wanted to avoid one of the reasons we wanted to avoid the oil 
Yes. And um, the net result, though, is there's not a lot of old oil wells drilled into the area because there's <laughs> no oil. <laughs> Uh, but we do have wells and we're in discussions to take over some of the existing well bores. So, uh, and we've, we've sampled from some of the existing wells. So, uh, and we've drilled our first well. And uh, you'll see photos up on our um, website here in the near future, near future of our drill. And when you see that picture, you can see we're working in that area in harmony with the agriculture industry we're in the middle of a barley field and you can see uh, canola fields in the distance um, by their bright yellow color and directly offsetting us. There's an oil battery, single well oil batteries for Viking oil. So we're in an area it's that the Viking oil is in a shallower formation than the lithium. So it creates a nice uh, separation and allows us to work in harmony with these producers. It's certainly, especially when you see, say, like a hard rock formation or even like the Salars, like people will think like in, in Chile or Peru, where it's a lot of landmass, a lot of space, and it's kind of cooking in the sun. Uh, this is not that. So, I mean, you could you could just see, uh, you wouldn't realize that there is uh, mining for lithium going on there. <laughs> yeah, and we've had to, we've met with uh, local officials in the area and with the uh, Saskatchewan regulator. Uh, to talk about what they're doing and they're very all very supportive once they understand what you're doing and how it's different yeah and i'm sure too because people might think oh wait a second there's drilling and maybe they're looking for this and that it's like no no you're looking specifically for lithium this is a lithium play and that and the demand curve for this i mean is is pretty outstanding right now at this point yes um well we're certainly seeing there's a shift right now we're very dependent upon asia for our uh lithium and our batteries. And we're seeing a definite shift uh, with initiatives from both the Canadian and the US federal governments um, to bring that into North America. And we see ourselves as just being a key supplier to uh, that growing industry that's going to emerge within North America, building the batteries. And we'll, we hope to be a best in class, environmentally responsible company supplying lithium salts to that industry that's a large you've got like sixty four thousand hectares is, is that around that um yeah we have six we have 250 sections it's about sixty five thousand yeah. sixty six thousand okay. hectares right now and, and i'm i'm assuming i mean I, I would think because of where you are i mean the infrastructure is there <laughs> you've got oh, loads yeah. of infrastructure there's paved yeah. roads there's obviously labor and skilled labor there's rail you name it Yes, um, I've worked at this area for shallower oil horizons in multiple times in my career. And uh, I love working in the Kindersley area. And when I visited our rig drilling, I was reminded of that as we were working and I'm seeing services for the drilling rig showing up on site right out of Kindersley, which is 20 minute drive away from our first well. I mean, I, so without saying, I mean, you're doing the RTS, you're well funded, you're ready to go. Uh, you've got an inferred resource. You're, of course, going to want to grow that. Uh, what are the steps you're going to take as soon as this RTA is ready to go? You're off and running. What's kind of the methodology that you'll be using and, and moving forward? Uh, we have a number of things. We we have a path towards commercialization, and we have a number of milestones that we're laying out that we want to achieve. So there's there's multiple paths that we're we're following at the same time. One is going to be expanding the resource through drilling and test results. Um, we do have land outside of our inferred resource report, so we can grow our inferred resource report in these other areas as well. Um, through drilling, uh, we're gonna need to drill in those areas to get those that inferred resor resource report. But uh, yeah, we'll be able to grow. And at the same time, we're going to be evaluating technology. We're talking to multiple te technology partners uh, and, uh, you know, DLE, it's been around for 50 years. It's, it works. <laughs> yeah. the, the only thing that we have to work with industry partners on, and there's more than there's multiple companies doing this at the same time is what's the right technology for scaling DLE up to commercial scale. And there's companies in this space that are well ahead of us. Uh, our, 
our mantra though is we're first and foremost a resource company we're not a technology company um, and we're agnostic to what technology we use so that's why we will ev evaluate multiple operators for the technology work with an engineering firm to help us choose the right technology and then scale it up first to the pilot and then to the facility side of our business yeah, it's so, interesting I, I, that not having to go into the technology side because uh, you, you can go down a rabbit hole on that very quickly. And if you have the resource, uh, you have situations like even with E3 Lithium, they've partnered with Imperial Oil. You start attracting bigger fish who are like, hey, listen, we like the resource. We understand it. And not to get into the technology side, but my limited understanding of DLE is sometimes it's very regional specific. So even if someone's kind of ahead of you with testing things, that's actually not a bad thing because they can nail down some of the, uh, the you know, pros and cons right now while you're getting your resource ready and you, you're kind of doing some of the R and D for you. Uh, and you can then look to see what is the best uh, player or best partner to look for at that point to, to, to have the, the absorbent and the technology side done. Yes. Um, e E3 is kind of a, a wannabe for us, ex except for the fact that we don't feel the need to own the technology. And E3 is now, I believe, thinking about marketing their technology to others. So we will have the ability to use them or there's a, a whole host of opportunities out there and we can watch and see what they're doing. And to be honest, the way we see some of the technology providers is they're, they're working in a lab yeah. and they're not facility engineers. So we have to find the right engineering firm to support us in terms of taking the technology up to that scalable size that we need. And we're already talking to some and they're talking about how, how they can regenerate some of the agents that they use um, in the process and make it even more efficient. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to watch and it's not that much unlike the evolution that we saw heavy oil in Western Canada go through with, it used to be it was cold flow, then it was huff and puff, then it's sag D. There's a whole host of technologies and that came through time and people end up working with the one that works. So we hope to identify the one that works for us and our brine and you touched on it. It's very, it can be very regional specific. In many ways, our brine you know, apart from things like oil, um, is not that far different from E3's brine. That's, uh, that's very handy. And I mean, there's other big names that people have heard about is like Lilac, you know, out of, you know, in partner with like MIT California. and Cal out of California, like big brain people working on this stuff. And then occasionally you see these hit pieces saying, you know, does DLE work? So I, was, I wanted you to bring that up because we could put that to rest is that, uh, it, it works. It's just a matter of finding the right partner in that region. Uh, and the the positive upside of that is that the uh, there's tons of positives amongst the, but on the environmental side is you don't use a lot of water either. No, no, it's uh, it's not like the impact on the water that happens if we would do the big tailings ponds yes. like they do yeah. in South America. We don't ha we we won't have that. And to be blunt, you know the tailings ponds that they use for evaporation concentration in South America it takes too long. And uh, it wouldn't work in Saskatchewan. It'd be frozen in the back. Yeah. Half and, the year, you'd have to have these big, huge floodlights on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, it, it, in Canada is like a world leader when it comes to environmental responsibility. And there's no way that they would even approve that. And you're yeah. seeing the impetus in South America to quickly m move away from those evapo concentration ponds and lake resources who's working with lilac is a leader in that yeah and and their their success is great is great for everyone in the space because once again the yes. demand for lithium is is massive and being in saskatchewan alberta as well i mean uh, the pathway to permitting to work with the government is very simple uh they want they're they're excited about this transition as well so it's not like there's a, a lot of Im impediments um, they they want this success as well because it, it can help towards this this shift that that uh, so many people want. Yes, we really like working in Saskatchewan. They're a great regulatory regime to work within. Several of our team members are originally from Saskatoon. Um, Two thousand nine, I was Saskatchewan Oilman of the Year. Um, we love Saskatchewan, and we've had meetings and phone calls with uh, their 
regulator, and we've met with the uh, field regulators in, um, uh, in Kindersley as well that are in charge of uh, supervising us in this area. So what, like, I mean, you've got a lot going on here. What are some things that people, if they want to kind of like really chart you out for the next while, you're going to be trading soon. So they can go to your site uh, and, and take a look at some of the, the details, but you're going to have, you have an inferred resource. that's pretty strong. You're going to build that out. Uh, what, what are some of the milestones if someone wants to kind of put a checklist to make sure that they're, you're keeping track? Because often we, we say like, especially nowadays, the price of a stock right now may not reflect in any way the, the potential or the, the add-in cost or, or, or potential growth that's there within the stock or, or kind of goodwill that's being, you know, asset inside built in on the assets inside. Well, we've already talked about how we have a, a plan and we execute our plan and we move forward. The plan's flexible depending on what's happening, but uh, we keep on moving everything forward. And part of moving everything forward is it also generates updates for our shareholders. So as we expand our resource base in other areas, as we um, confirm the quality of our resource through testing wells. And there's three key, th there's a number of key things that really control your economics for lithium. One is the, the quality of the resource. Do you have high lithium concentrations? But you also need to have that volume of the resource. So you need thick reservoir porosity within your area. So that's another reason we chose our area. And we also chose it for its shallow depth. So um, we continue to want to show people that we can generate the deliverability. So that's the other big thing in the economics is, can you produce the volume of brine that you need to extract enough lithium? And so one of the things that we hope to achieve with this well is we will collect flows at different pressures. So that we'll vary the flow and collect the different pressures. And that allows us to do projections of what we will be able to achieve in terms of flow when we put in um, an electric submersible pump, which everybody's talking about to get the flow of the brine out of your reservoir. Yeah. So we'll be able to provide updates on our ability to flow. And that's a big driver on our, on the economics for anybody. And um, we think we'll have pretty strong volumes coming out of our reservoir. And we hope to demonstrate that to our shareholders. And that'll get us into uh, roughly, say we're getting into second quarter of 2023, you'll have done a lot of extraction testing, GLC testing of wells, concentration testing, and then you'll uh, you'll be looking at a lab pilot somewhere probably around there. And then of course a PEA sometime in Q2 2023. Is that, that's kind of the, the mapping of the plan? Yes. Um, we will be um, increasing some of our staff to help us with the technology side and then also engaging with an engineering firm that will help us with uh, our selection process uh, for the technology company and um, and the economics behind it because that's what will drive our um, preliminary economic assessment that we're driving hard towards because that'll help us with you know future fundraising and demonstrating to our shareholders what we can do with this asset. And it's such an exciting time. I mean, lithium prices are, are they've gone through the roof in the past, you know, six months to a year. Uh, yes. They don't even need to hold up that high for a lot of these projects to be extremely no. economical. So no. when we first started this uh, running models and we felt like we could make a reasonable rate of return in the market at the price it was at that time, which was 9,000 US dollars per ton. <laughs> For lithium carbonate equivalent and it's well, the markets are all different but we're seeing prices in asia of sixty-five thousand yeah. us dollars per ton and uh we don't need that price to, no. to be successful yeah. we, we, we can move forward at a low, lot lower price and still create a, a great rate of return for our share, shareholders and just to reiterate, you know, you know, the, the time factor here, the, the difference in a hard rock mine or a Salar in Chile or Peru, say you make a discovery, you've got an inferred resource there, just to kind of highlight to people what the timeline difference would be with this type of model compared to a traditional model. Yeah, um, 
I know hard rock do, does seem to take a long time to go <laughs> from delineation to actual mine. Um, it seems to me to be on the order of 10 years. Um, some of our competitors are putting out uh, estimates for being uh, commercial by 2025, 2026. And we certainly think we can catch up in a heck of a hur hurry and join our competitors in that time frame. The other thing is we're Canada. Um, and I, I hate to, you know, jump up and wave the flag, but there's all kinds of issues with governments operating in South America. And I'm not meaning to dump on those countries, but uh, you have to have a solid regime and work with them. We're Canada. We know what the framework is. It's, it's laid I, out for us. And I'm glad you brought that up. You'd mentioned before too, I mean, because ESG is such a buzzword. And I've heard many lawyers say, like, listen, for decades, Canada is, is really far ahead on this ESG thing. It's not going to change a lot of business. The environmental standards here are huge. And not only that, I kind of tell people as well is that you want that regulation and you want that in your backyard rather than it being somewhere else, because then you can control and make sure that it's doing it and not impacting the environment in a negative way and you're doing it correctly. Yes. Uh, and I think we're going to find moving forward, it's going to matter like where you're sourcing your lithium, where you're sourcing your copper, uh, because, you know, yeah, sure, you can get it cheaper somewhere else. But, you know, listen, you know, are you taking into account all these other factors? Yeah, we need, to, we need to take pride in what Canada can provide to the market and not think that uh, we need to go offshore to get some of these uh, resources. And uh, we should be, you know, if I look at some of the chemistries that are needed for the batteries, you know, nickel. Well, Canada yeah. has lots of that. Cobalt. There's a, there's a town in, in Ontario called Cobalt because the yeah. silver came up with so much of it. Canada is well-placed to be a leader in the battery market. We certainly have the manpower. We have the engineers. We can do this. And that's what's so exciting. And it's it's so exciting to talk with someone as well that sees this, that's excited about it, and uh, it has a, a fresh shell. It's brand new. I mean, so you know you don't have to worry about uh, you know the, the usual questions I have to talk about capital structure. This is rolling out in a week or so. Uh, take a look at grounded lithium. Uh, being a part of this whole shift in energy is a big deal. And I think more of the generalist investors, they're coming on side. They're seeing it. I mean, even Elon Musk, I think it was a week ago, was kind of hinting that maybe Canada will be ha having a gigafactory. All of this is great news for, for Canada as it acknowledges its, its huge role and huge potential role uh, moving forward in this big shift. Yes, and uh, even the U.S. industry's push and the recent initiatives put out by their federal government, they, they willingly accept what's going to come out of Canada. Perfect. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, we're really excited to see the results that you have and as, as you get uh, launched on the market. And of course, uh, as soon as you have any results, we'd love to uh, follow up with you and find out more. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate your time today. Absolutely. All the best. Take care.